I am here with William Lane Craig. You know him as a leading philosopher and apologist. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take a behind-the-scenes look at the people that have shaped who he is and his experiences in life. Bill is a friend, also a colleague at Talbot Theological Seminary, and really appreciate your ministry and your friendship. So thanks for coming on the show. I'm very glad to be with you, Sean, today. We're going to get into some of the stories that maybe people won't know about you, but I'd love if you just begin with your story to faith, because I know you didn't start as a believer, but ended up becoming one in your teen years, I believe it was. That's correct. I wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family, uh, though it was a good and loving home. Uh, And when I was a teenager, I began to ask what I call the big questions in life. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the meaning of my life? Uh, And in the search for answers, I began to attend all on my own, a large church in our community. Only problem was, instead of answers to my questions, what I encountered there was a sort of social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate, and the other high school students, who pretended to be such good Christians on Sunday, lived for their real God the rest of the week, wow. which was popularity. Wow. And this really bothered me, because I thought, mm. here I am so spiritually empty inside, mm. and yet these people claim to be Christians, and I'm leading a better life than they are, at least externally. They must be just as empty as I am, but they're putting on a false front, pretending to be something they're not. They're just a pack of hypocrites. And so I began to get very resentful toward the institutional church for the hypocrisy and phoniness that I saw there. And pretty soon this attitude spread toward people in general. Everybody I thought, is a hypocrite. They're all holding up a plastic mask to the world while the real person is cowering down inside, afraid to come out and be real. Mm. And so that anger turned toward people in general, and I, I, I turned away from them. I said, I don't need people. I don't want people. I threw myself into my studies Uh, And I was on my way toward becoming, frankly, a very alienated young Mm. man. But at the same time, in moments of introspection, when I looked into my own heart, I knew that deep down inside, I wanted to love and to be loved just Mm. like other people. And I realized in that moment that I was just as much a hypocrite as they were, because here I was putting on this brave front, pretending I don't need people when deep down inside I really did. And so that anger turned in upon myself for my own phoniness and hypocrisy. Mm. And this kind of inner anger just eats away at your insides day after day, making every day miserable, another day to get through. And one day I was feeling particularly crummy, and I walked into my high school German class, Mm. and I sat down behind a girl who is one of these types that is always so happy, (laughs) it just makes you sick. (laughs) And I tapped her on the shoulder, and she turned around, and I said to her, Sandy, what are you always so happy about anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I'm saved. Wow. And I said, you What? And she said, I know Jesus Christ is my personal savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. And I said, well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? And she said, because he loves you, Bill. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Here she said there was someone who really loved me. And who was it? but the God of the universe. And that thought just staggered me to think that the God of the universe could love me, that worm named Bill Craig down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth. I just couldn't take it in. Well, I went home that night and I found a New Testament that had been given to me by the Gideons when they visited our Grade school, handing out New Testaments. And for the first time, I opened it and began to read it. And as I did so, Sean, I was absolutely captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a wisdom about this man's teachings that I had never encountered before. 
but especially there was an authenticity wow. about his life that wasn't characteristic of those people in that local church I went to who were claiming to be his followers. And I realized that I couldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, Sandy introduced me to other Christians in the high school, and no matter what they said about God or Jesus, what I couldn't deny was that these people seemed to be in touch with a different plane of reality that I didn't even dream existed, a reality that gave a deep meaning and significance to their lives that I really craved. So after about six months of the most intense soul searching that I've ever been through in my entire life, I finally just came to the end of my rope. Uh, and one evening about eight o'clock just cried out to God and yielded my life to him. And at the same time, uh, I felt this tremendous infusion of joy, like a balloon being blown up and blown up until it was ready to burst. And I rushed outside. It was a warm September Midwestern evening. And as I looked up at the sky, I could see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. Wow. And as I looked at the stars, I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment changed my whole life because I had thought enough about this during those six months to realize that if Bill Craig ever became a Christian, I could do nothing less than devote my entire life to spreading this message among mankind. Because if this is the truth, if it's really the truth, then this is the greatest news ever announced. And so for me, my call to full-time vocational Christian service was simultaneous with my conversion. Bill, this uh, girl you mentioned, her name is Sandy. Mm -hmm. Have Does she know what you're doing now with your life and ministry? Have you touched base with her after that season at all? Well, we drifted apart after graduating from high school. She went off to Illinois State. I went to Wheaton, and we didn't see each other after that. Um, but years later, many years later, I was speaking at Bradley University in my hometown of Peoria. And after I was finished, this middle-aged woman mm. came up to me and she held out her hand and I shook her hand and she said nothing. She just looked at me and continued to hold my hand. And I said, I, I'm sorry, do I know you? <laughs> and she said, I'm Sandy. Wow. And then it was as though the years melted away and I saw in her face that 16-year-old girl that I remembered. And it was such a sweet reunion. Mm. Uh, and, and she told me that her boys at Peoria Christian High School were in an apologetics class at that time. And their professor was showing videos from my debates wow. to train her sons <laughs> in apologetics. And so it was just a kind of the circle of life, you know, that was so beautiful. Uh, and we have kept in touch then since that time. Uh, that is so stunning that a girl with joy and simply says, I knew Jesus led to this transformation in your life and your ministry. I mean, it's yeah. stunning to think about that. Now that's six months for you that you were yeah. wrestling with this. Were those apologetic questions or were they more? They were not, Sean. I, I, I'm so uh, sorry to disappoint people who think <laughs> I went through this great intellectual search. I was convinced this was true. Just reading the New Testament, as I say, and the ring of truth about it that was undeniable. But I read books, for example, Peace with God by Billy Graham, uh, The Secret of Happiness. I read the New Testament from cover to cover, and was just captivated by it. So for me, it was a matter of making the transition from the head to the heart, mm. uh, from, from just believing that it's true to making a life commitment. Uh, and I remember telling Sandy at the time, I said, I, I just can't look five years into the future and see Bill Craig as a Christian. And she very wisely said to wow. me, don't think about the future, Bill. She said, just look at what it, at today and you decide now whether or not you want to make that commitment. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually then I did. 
Yeah, that's great advice. So you didn't start off saying I'm going to do philosophy and apologetics where my dad's story, you know, was trying to disprove Christianity. So instantly yeah. it had that element to it. When did you start focusing on philosophy and apologetics? Well, with respect to apologetics, when I did become a Christian my junior year in high school, I was immediately faced with explaining to my family members and my friends why I had made this radical step. So right from the beginning, I was involved in giving reasons for Christian belief. But this was focused and deepened when I went off to Wheaton College. Um, upon graduation, I attended Wheaton, which is a Christian liberal arts college in Illinois that has a very strong emphasis on the integration of faith and learning, not sticking your brains in one pocket and your faith in the other pocket and never letting them see the light of day at the same time but rather integrating faith and learning to develop a Christian Weltanschauung, as they called it, or Christian worldview. And so it was at Wheaton that I was seized by this vision of sharing the gospel in the context of giving an intellectual defense of the Christian worldview. That's, that's fascinating. And, uh, when did, did you join crew right away or how did that fit in? Because my dad was on crew and my parents mm. are still on crew staff. What Isn't season that was that in your life? Well, when I was a senior at Wheaton, I wanted to go on to seminary. I, I, I knew I wanted to get theological training. But my senior year, I was in chapel and John Guest was speaking in chapel. He was a band member of a group called the Excursions. Mm. And he challenged us uh, that we had been soaking up for four years at Wheaton all of this knowledge and learning. And he said, it's time to wring out the sponge. Take a couple of years out of your education and get involved in practical Christian ministry. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. How could I best do that? And for me, the answer seemed obvious, Campus Crusade for Christ. Gotcha. I had heard Bill Bright lecture at Wheaton. I was aware of staff members uh, of Campus Crusade. And so upon graduation, I, um, I became a staff member gotcha. of Campus Crusade for Christ um, and spent two years with Crusade. And it was exactly what I'd hoped it was be wonderful, wonderful, practical ministry application of what I'd been learning, learning how to lead someone to Christ, how to disciple that person uh, in the Lord. It was a fantastic experience. One of the things I've most appreciated about you, I've never told you this, but obviously first rate philosophical work, but just a heart for the gospel and a basis of why we do this. Growing up with parents on crew, I see the value of that. <laughs> And so let me shift. I've heard you talk about sometimes in your life, you had some physical challenges when you were younger. Now, I know you exercise, both you and I like to, to uh -huh. lift and have talked about that at times, but you've had some physical challenges that maybe kept you out of sports that maybe God used to get you to focus on debate and other things. Would you be able to, willing to share? Something? That's right. Sure. My brother and I both inherited from my mom uh, a genetic neuromuscular disorder mm. called Charcot-Marie-Tooth syndrome. And this is a neuromuscular syndrome that causes atrophy in the extremities. It is progressive. It gets worse and worse as you age. And um, it's incurable. Uh, fortunately, it's not fatal. It's not like Lou Gehrig's disease. It, it mainly affects you from the elbows to the fingertips and from the knees to the toes. Uh, and wow. so over the years, this has become more and more advanced. Uh, my hands now look like some 90-year-old man's all, you know, arthritic looking and atrophied. Wow. My calves have shriveled terribly. Mm. Uh, so right from youth, this was an inhibition. And... I walked funny, and so other children would make fun of me and call me names, and 
uh, mock me because of this. And this caused deep hurt. Um, and I think probably contributed to that alienation that I described mm. earlier. Um, one of the psychological effects of this was that it gave me an intense drive to succeed. I, I remember, for example, one day in junior high school, since I wasn't into athletics, I didn't care about sports, the teacher gave us a math problem where we had to figure out something about baseball scores. And part of the problem said that every game played was a single game. And I, I went up to the front and I said, what does it mean to say it's a single game? And the teacher said to me, standing in front of the rest of the class, well, Bill, I would think any red-blooded American boy would know that. Mm. And, and a girl, one of the popular girls sitting in the front said, gee, Bill, even I know that. Wow. And I felt so humiliated. <laughs> and inside what I thought was, I'll show them. Someday, I'm going to become something, wow. uh, and, and they won't be able to laugh at me anymore. Now, remember, I was a non-believer at the time, and so it seemed that in academics, I could succeed where I couldn't, say, in sports. And so uh, I pursued academics, I think largely, or at least partly, because of the self worth that it gave to me. It enabled me to have a sense of self-worth and a good self-image because I could, I could accomplish something as well. And so as a result of Chakra Marie Tooth, I'm extremely goal-oriented, uh, Sean. I, I even get a sense of accomplishment when I empty the shampoo bottle in the shower, <laughs> finally. That's so uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, just very goal-oriented. And this has uh, pluses and minuses to it, sure. obviously. You know, it, it can make you achieve a lot, but it can also tend to make you insensitive and to run over mm. uh, other people. And so... After becoming a Christian, I had to learn how to temper this mm. by really realizing that my worth is to be found in Christ and um, his love for me and not in what I can accomplish or achieve. That's really powerful. I appreciate your your honesty and just vulnerability sharing about these things. It's it's moving and it's it's encouraging as well. One thing I would love to know is who are the people that most influence you? And this could be philosophers it could be a friend it could be a professor like when you think of the top maybe two or three people who are they and, and yeah. in what ways do they influence you i think that my mother was one of the greatest influences upon my life not only physically as i've just described but she had uh, an incredible curiosity and would take us children to every factory and manufacturing plant in the little Iowa town we were I was raised in, in order to see, for example, how milk was bottled, how pickles were made, how cardboard boxes were done. We went to the big hydroelectric dam across the Mississippi there in Keokuk, and just everything, she would feed that curiosity, that intellectual interest uh, in me. And my parents told me as a young boy, anything that will contribute to your education, we will pay for. And wow. they were as good as their word. They, they paid for anything that I wanted that would contribute to my education. And so that sense of curiosity, also from my mom, a sense of individuality and nonconformity that has served me very well in going against the crowd and being willing to be... Um, reviled or, or, or mocked. Mm. My mother always emphasized to be an individual, to not go with the crowd, to stand up for yourself. You know, if there was an Easter egg hunt in the neighborhood, <laughs> she would tell me to run in the opposite direction of all the oh. other children to, to find the eggs. I mean, that was the kind of individualism that she instilled into me. Uh, and it was reconfirmed by my father as well, who was a very upright, 
honest, good man. I mean, my parents belonged to the greatest generation, you know, the generation that won World War II. And, and he modeled for me that kind of integrity mm-hmm. that I, if I might just be permitted one story. Please. Before we be, before I became a Christian, my family would sometimes on holidays attend that church that I eventually went to. Interesting. And one day, we were sitting as a family in the pew, and it turned out to be a communion service. And row by row, they were inviting people to go forward and take communion. And I thought, what's going to happen when it gets to our row? You know, my dad isn't going to want to do this. And sure enough, when it got to our row, the usher said, would you like to go forward? And my father looked at him and said, no, uh, we don't care to partake. We'll just sit here. And I said, dad, can't we just go forward? And he just looked at me, you know, and kind of silenced me (laughs) with a look. And I just sat back and gritted my teeth. And there, you know, in front of everybody else going forward, we were the one family that refused to take communion, Wow! you know, that, that Sunday. And that was a kind of integrity even my father's unbelief had. It was, it was an unbelief with integrity. Mm. And that stood me very well, Sean, mm. when later in life I became a Christian and had to stand with integrity for what I believe and not compromise in the face of the pressure of the crowd. So my parents were a tremendous influence on me. Sandy, I've already mentioned through her, I became a Christian. And then my wife, Jan, has been unbelievable Mm. in the partner she's been to me. She's been the wind beneath my wings. Uh, I told her early on in our marriage, honey, I can do anything if there's just one person who really believes in me. Wow. And she later told me that at that wow. moment she resolved that I will be that person. And oh she goodness. has been over the years. Uh, she has made it her goal to make me as effective as I can possibly be in the Lord's work. And so I owe an incalculable debt to her. Bill, that's really powerful. I want to unpack that a little bit. There's a little bit of a, a whistling sound coming um, from your side. I'm not sure what it is or if there's a way to turn turn down a little bit. We'll just we'll keep going. It is what it is. Um, I, uh-huh. I, I, I that that sounds good right there. I've heard my my father say he came from a pretty broken background. He said he'll say to me, "Son, I never imagined that uh-huh. a woman could love a man." the way your mom loves me. And I get teary-eyed thinking about it. It sounds like that she plays that same role in your life and the times you might not be as motivated or discouraged. She is that person that shapes you. Would you talk about just how she does that and what that looks like in your relationship? Well, one very, very practical way, Sean, uh, is that she was trained as an executive secretary. She could type like 120 words a minute on an IBM Selectric typewriter. And so she has typed both of my master's theses, both of my doctoral dissertations, all of my books, all of my articles that I've published up until very, very recently when now I can do them with dictation software myself. But that would be just one very practical way in which she has been a help to me. And even today, she will say to me, give me the grunt work. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. If there's somebody that needs to be called, I'll call them. If there's some word processing thing to do, I'll do it. You spend your time on the important stuff. Let me do the grunt work. Mm -hmm. And so just in very practical ways, she lightens my burden, not to mention the fact that she's a great cook and <laughs> homemaker and the mother of our children. I mean, just um, uh, she's a Proverbs 31 woman. That's that's amazing. I love to hear that. Uh, I'd be curious about the books that most influence you. And they could be books. Obviously, the Bible is an answer that is obviously yeah. huge in your life. But even over a career, what book was pivotal to you, changed your thinking, right. formative in some sense? Yeah. 
I would say it was reading Edward John Carnell's book, An Introduction to Christian Apologetics, uh, while at Wheaton. I took a course called Conflicts in Biblical Christianity, and for that course, I read Carnell's book, and I had never read anything like this before in my life. Uh, in this book, Carnell was asking questions like, what is truth? How do we test for truth? How do we know that Christianity is true? And these were the kind of questions I was interested in. And so it was really Carnell that catapulted me in, in this direction. And Carnell was interesting. He was himself a Wheaton grad. Oh, very and interesting. He had, he had earned doctorates in both philosophy and theology. Wow. And I thought, wow, if I could ever do that someday, that would be a dream come true. But I never imagined that I actually would. But Carnell set that example and goal for me. That's really fascinating uh, to, to, to see that influence. So you don't hear him cited as much. Is it because he maybe didn't publish in an academic book that his research would have been a part of some of the 60s and 70s philosophical revolution? Did that maybe play a role in it? I think that's right. Carnell died, I think, in 1968. Okay. He was a professor at Fuller Seminary. Okay. Um, so he belonged to the era of Carl Henry and uh, Achengay and uh, Gordon Clark and Cornelius okay. Van Til. And that generation was just completely eclipsed by the revolution in Christian philosophy that's taken place since around uh, 1967 or so. Mm. That makes sense. That That's powerful. I In class, I believe it was philosophy religion, I had you in my master's program, the MA Phil program at Talbot. So this is probably 17, 16, 17 years ago. You started off by sharing a story of how you deal with failure related to, if I remember correctly, your doctorate in theology. Yeah. Would you be willing to share that story and just kind of the lesson that you took away from it? Yes. Briefly, um, when I finished my doctoral dissertation under Wolfhard Pollenbach at the University of Munich, I had to take oral examinations in theology. And I didn't know how to prepare for these. So I sought to have an appointment with Professor Pommenberg over and over again. But Sean, German professors <laughs> are like little demigods compared to their students. Students are like wow. dirt under their heels. Wow. And Herr Professor Doctor couldn't be bothered to meet with me. And so I was never able to get an appointment with him to learn how to prepare for this oral exam. And so I thought, well, I'll go to his assistant, Gunther Wenz, and I asked Herr Wenz, how should I prepare for this exam? And he said, oh, forget about it. And I, well, I wasn't that stupid. <laughs> uh, and I said, no, no, come on now. How can I prepare for this? And he said, well, Pollenberg always asks questions only over his own writings. So master everything he's written and you'll be prepared. Well, that sounded like good advice to me. So over the next few months, I read literally or virtually everything that Pollenberg had ever published and took notes on it and memorized it and so forth. And so I went in to this exam and sat down with Professor Pollenberg, the dean, and one other faculty member, and the questioning began. And Pollenberg began to ask questions in his writings. Wow, wow. And over and over wow. and over again, I had to respond, I don't know. Wow. And I could feel my doctoral degree slipping away like sand oh, through my fingers, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. It was the most terrifying, horrible feeling I'd ever had. And at the end of the exam, Pollenberg asked a couple of condescendingly easy questions as if to come down to my level. 
my humiliation was complete. Well, uh, I, I was just crushed. I was devastated. We believed that God had called me to do this doctorate in, in Germany, and he'd provided marvelously all the way to do so, and now I had failed and were, was going home in defeat. And, uh, well, I learned a lot of lessons out of that, but one of the the things that one of our friends advised us about was don't make a decision right away mm. what to do about this. Mm. Give it some time to heal. In Germany, if you fail the exam once, you can take it again in wow. a year's time. And I knew after thinking about it, I had to do it again. Otherwise, I would spend the rest of my life second guessing oh. what would have happened if I had taken it again. And so I knew I had to risk it. And so that first year back in the States, teaching at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, I spent every spare moment I had preparing for this exam wow. in systematic theology back in Munich. I, I spent more time preparing for that exam than I did preparing for my lectures in my classes. I wow. really neglected <laughs> my teaching responsibilities to prepare for this exam. Well, finally, uh, the next August then, a year after you know, coming home, I went back to Munich and um, I had a stack of notes about a foot high on systematic theology from the ancient uh, church fathers to contemporary theologians on every aspect of wow. systematic wow. theology, doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of sin, doctrine of salvation, doctrine of the church. And here's one thing that I learned, by the way, preparing for that. I, I discovered that I had been woefully underprepared by my seminary education in the United States. Wow. Uh, I think that the training that we give at our American seminaries in systematic theology is like elementary school hmm. compared to what German students get. And so I learned more about systematic theology during that year of preparation than during my entire seminary uh, experience. Wow. Uh, wow. And I walked into Pollenberg's office. It looked just like it had before. There was the dean, there was Pollenberg, there was one of the other faculty members, and he began to ask questions. And to my absolute joy, the answers just rolled off my Love tongue, it. just fluidly, easily, uh, effortlessly. There was only one question that tripped me up that I couldn't answer, and that was why Hegel's um, Christology entailed the death of God. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. Oh, my goodness. So that one I didn't know. Um, and so I, Pallenberg awarded me a magna cum laude wow. uh, on my, um, my exam and my, my degrees. And so I came out of there. I was dancing on air, mm. Sean. It was such a victory. Uh, and I learned so much about theology uh, as a result of failing that exam. But then the spiritual lesson that I learned was just as important. I had always naively thought that if you're a Christian walking in the center of God's will, you cannot fail. Wow. Now, that may sound very naive, but yeah. I had a rather nuanced understanding. I thought there would be trials, of course, tribulations. But if you're walking in the center of God's will, God will see you through those trials, and you'll come out victorious in the end. What I learned, Sean, is that God's will for your life can include failure. That's powerful. It could be God's will that you fail, and he will lead you in the fullness of the Holy Spirit into failure. Wow. Because God has things to teach us through failure that we could never learn through success. Um, and that was the case for me. That's a that's a great lesson. I, I love that. That's really encouraging again. Let me, now, those those notes that you took, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. have become the basis of your Defender series. Right. right. That's that's exactly right. Hmm. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, 
another question for you. Uh, do you have a favorite book in the Bible or a favorite story in the Bible that just motivates you? Well, I've always really enjoyed the book of Colossians. Um, there Paul warns about the dangers of philosophy and um, shows how it is through Christ that we find the fullness of God in human form and that all these other religious efforts to reach God apart from Christ are ultimately futile and unavailing. And so Colossians has been a book that I've greatly appreciated. That is, that's really fascinating. I don't know that I've ever heard somebody say that was their favorite book. So mm. that's, that's, that's interesting. On the flip side, you mentioned how you deal with failure. What about success? You've had some pretty high-profile yeah. opportunities, being invited on the Ben Shapiro show, sharing the stage with Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Uh, how spiritually do you deal with success and try to stay grounded yeah. and faithful amidst that? Well, you know, Paul says, uh, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. And when I think with sober judgment, Sean, I am acutely aware of my shortcomings and limitations and mm. insignificance. Um, and so in that sense, uh, one, is, one is humbled by how little one knows. The more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. And I have right here on my desk beside me, uh, under the glass, a picture of Isaac Newton, perhaps the greatest physicist who ever lived. And I want to read you the inscription uh, from Newton's Principia. He says, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but I myself seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst a great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Mm. Oh, if Newton could have that sense of humility and, and his own ignorance, how much more is that true of me? And so that, that right there next to my right hand on my desk is a reminder uh, of the need for that kind of humility. That, that's a wonderful way to uh, just daily remind yourself of somebody obviously as great as Isaac Newton is. How You've been doing this for a, a few decades. How do you yeah. stay motivated? What what does it take? Like, Do you ever feel like you're burned out sometimes? Or oh, motivation work for you? Um, I think for motivation, Sean, I, to be candid, is that I love what I do. I, I am pursuing my passion. Uh, I don't think I'll ever retire because I'm already doing what I want. I, I am just completely free to do whatever I want to do. And this is what I want to do. And so it, my, I, I, I don't even study topics that I think are important. I study topics that I'm passionate about. And so when you're following your passion, it's easy to stay motivated. Now, a few years ago, I began to lose some motivation. And I said to Jan, I, I feel like I'm, I'm losing my motivation. Um, I used to be able to study from morning until night without a break. And it wouldn't be a problem. But now I find that in the afternoon, I'm kind of worn out and I just don't want to work anymore. And I, I think I'm lo losing my motivation. And she said to me, you're not losing your motivation. She says, you just need to have a different schedule. And so she arranged it so that in the morning when I'm fresh, that's when I would do my heavy philosophical work. Then immediately after lunch, I would do lighter, more popular level work. And then from about four o'clock until six o'clock in the evening, when my brain is fried, mm. I would do interviews with Sean McDowell <laughs> and uh, email uh, that don't require a great deal of uh, intellectual effort. Uh, and that completely restored me. 
Uh, just having that schedule change uh, restored my energy levels and motivation so that I'm able to go full bore now until six in the evening when Jan and I have supper together. I, I love hearing that story. It was fun to see the two of you together in Israel a couple of years ago and just see the partnership yeah. and love and just, you know, there's so much to be said for that. She's just giving you the right advice at the right moments. She that, has. Uh, I mean, just what a, a blessing from the Lord through her. Do it, By the way, for those of you listening, if you have some personal questions uh, for Dr. William Lane Craig, just about how he studies, people that have influenced him, not apologetic questions. We can come back to that another time. But if you have questions you've always wanted just to ask him, put them in and I will do my best to address those in the comments. But one question I've never asked you, I've always wondered is, do you have doubts about your faith sometimes? Do you ever doubt and just think, am I crazy? Did a man really rise from the dead? And if yeah. so, how do you address those? Well, I think that every Christian has doubts. Well, I, I let me back up. Every thinking Christian has doubts. Anybody who holds to a position will ask himself, is my position really true? Could I be deceived? Could I be wrong? And here, Sean, I find it important not only to maintain one's personal devotional life so that the witness of the Holy Spirit will bear uh, testimony to the truth of God in your heart, but also to have those arguments and evidence to review. And I will be entirely candid and honest with you. When I look at these arguments for God's existence that I have defended in debates or in publications, and I weigh them, I look at these things and I shake my head and I said, these are really good arguments. <laughs> these really are convincing. Uh, and this was a real source of strength for me during my historical atom study. I, I, I really struggled with this whole thing about the existence of a historical atom and how we're to understand um, that, that subject. I, I went through real doubts about this. Uh, and, and I was always able to, to fall back on the evidence for the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus. And I was so thankful for that, that my faith had a firm, rational foundation that could explore doubts like the historical Adam honestly, uh, without walking away from the faith or losing one's faith. Well, uh, I heard you working through the historical Adam, and there's sometimes where I, you said something effective, I'm not really sure what to do with this. It makes me a little nervous or unsettled and yeah. you were sharing that publicly and i thought clearly you've thought through the implications of doing that right like how what was the reason and basis for sharing that before you came to conclusions it was it showing vulnerability uh, honesty what was the thinking behind how you approached well that? what it was sean unfortunately was an impromptu discussion with joshua swamidas in which josh was prompting me to say, well, why, why are you struggling with this, Bill? For Josh, this is fun. It's great. Oh, talk about all these different views. And here I was agonizing over these questions. And so this agony kind of came out in the interview as to, to why I was struggling so. And it had to do with Christology, because it seemed to me pretty clear that Jesus of Nazareth believed in the historical Adam. He refers to him and, and Eve as well. Now, if Jesus is divine, that means he's omniscient and therefore can hold no false beliefs. As a philosopher, I understand that. Many theologians don't. Um, but if Jesus believed there was a historical Adam, and in fact there was no such person, that means Jesus held false beliefs that he was therefore not omniscient and therefore he was not divine. And that just completely undermines the entire Christian faith. And so this historical Adam question took on a proportionality that seemed wholly out of gotcha. size yeah. with the issue itself. Now, unfortunately, an atheist podcaster picked up this interview with Swami Das okay. 
and made it sound like I was saying that the deity of Christ stands or falls on the existence of the historical Adam. And that's not at all what I think. As you'll read in the book, what I explain is, let's imagine a worst case scenario. Let's imagine that there was no historical Adam. Would Jesus be convicted then of having held a false belief? And I give an argument as to why that's not true, based upon a distinction that is very common in philosophy between accepting a proposition P and believing a proposition P. And what I suggest is that Jesus of Nazareth accepted the proposition that there was a historical Adam, even if the divine Logos, the person Christ is, did not actually believe it. Uh, And I think that that answers the objection. And in fact, there are some things about that model of the incarnation that make it a more plausible model than one in which one would say that Jesus did not accept any false beliefs. For example, Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, or he talks about the moon giving its light, when in fact the moon, as we know, is not luminous. Um, And what we can say is, I think, very plausibly, the incarnate Christ during the state of humiliation accepted those common beliefs, but the Logos, the divine Son of God, did not believe those false beliefs and therefore it doesn't impugn his omniscience. Now, that's the worst case scenario. Sure, sure. It shows, that in fact, you can defend the deity of Christ, even given the worst case scenario. But then the whole rest of the book is devoted to showing that it's perfectly scientifically plausible to believe that there was a historical atom. Good. Hope we can have it on and help have you on and help spread the word uh, for you. Well, I'd be happy to talk about it with you. Here's a quick question. I've heard you answer this before. You can probably do it in 10 seconds. When is the beard coming back? Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I think in general, a person with a gray beard looks so old and haggard <laughs> and worn. I just don't want to have that image. So it, it won't come back. Okay. Here's one a couple people asked about. What's your personal devotion, prayer, or Bible study approach like? Um, Well, I typically get up in the morning about 5.30, and I spend time in prayer for myself, for Jan, for our children, and then for the various events of the day and the work of the ministry and the staff of Reasonable Faith. And then I will read a portion out of the Greek New Testament. I want to maintain my New Testament Greek. And so I find the best way to do it is to do my devotional reading in the New Testament in Greek. And so currently I'm reading the Gospel of Mark. Uh, In the past, I've sometimes also read a commentary in connection with what I'm reading uh, and a page out of the Church Fathers. That's awesome. Um. Oh, I just missed one here. It said, oh, what what do you do for fun? Um, My work is fun. Hmm. Um, I love what I do. And so that is my fun. But uh, in addition to that, on the weekends, I enjoy gardening. Um, I go out and as Jan puts it, I commune with the weeds. I take out my frustrations and stress by yanking weeds, you know, out of hands. And so I pull them all over the yard. And so I, I will spend every Saturday morning out in the uh, out in the garden, out in the yard, mm. uh, hoeing and weeding and cutting and trimming and things of that sort. And that's a great outlet. I really enjoy that. And you still enjoy exercising and lifting as you can? Yeah, I I do exercise. And I have to say, Sean, as you probably have found, that if it becomes habitual, it actually can be enjoyable. I I mean, at first, I just hated it. It was just pure discipline. Dr. Montgomery, who was my church history professor, once put it so well. He said, whenever I feel like exercising, I go lie down until it goes away. (laughs) That's sort of the way I felt. But if you can make it a habit, then after a while, it just becomes routine and it actually does feel good and you can enjoy it. So yeah, I I do that. Jan and I also enjoy going out to eat uh, when we can. And um, 
when we travel, we love to go sightseeing. If we're in Turkey, for example, we'll wow. go sightseeing in Istanbul. Or when we're in China, visit the Great Wall. Um, or uh, in Italy, you know, go to the Colosseum or, or St. Peter's Cathedral. We really enjoy sightseeing. And so um, we, we like to do that, too, when we can. That's that's awesome. I love I love hearing that. Here here's a couple about the program. What's what's unique about the MA philosophy program that you've been involved in for a long time with JP Morlin at Talbot? Why should somebody consider doing that program? Okay. Well, I don't think there is any other MA level program that has the caliber of faculty that we do at Talbot. Um, MA programs are sort of a dying breed. People typically go right from their BA into a PhD program, and they may just sort of throw in the MA as a kind of throwaway degree. But at Talbot, the MA is our terminal degree because we don't want to give out cheap PhDs. We want to prepare students for PhD programs at the top secular universities by giving them a stepping stone to. Uh, a terminal degree at one of those schools. And so we have a very highly developed uh, curriculum and excellent faculty that routinely places our graduates in PhD programs all around the United States and abroad. The other th couple of things that should be mentioned is the, the Christian emphasis at Talbot. You will be getting a Christian worldview, a Christian perspective on philosophy. And the faculty in the department are committed to certain philosophical distinctions, distinctives, like the value of natural theology, arguments for the existence of God, the objectivity and, dis and knowability of truth, the objectivity of moral values, uh, mind-body dualism, uh, all of these would be philosophical distinctives that the faculty agree on and teach in our classes. And so students will be equipped, I think, um, in a Christian world and life view when they come away from Talbot. And then I guess the last thing that I would mention is it's quite remarkable that all of the faculty in the philosophy department at Talbot have either pastoral or missionary experience. They have been the pastors of churches, or they've been staff members with Campus Crusade for Christ. They are involved or have been involved in ministry. And this pastoral heart is reflected in their teaching and in their classes. Bill, I think I've told you this. I did my undergrad at Biola, loved it, did my doctorate at Southern Baptist. But that M.A. Phil program, my wife, who you know, Stephanie, my high school sweetheart, she said during that three years— she saw more transformation in my life, just my confidence, my beliefs, my mm. understanding of faith than any season of my life. So wow. any of you watching this, you've thought, you know what, I'm going back to master's program, thought about studying apologetics with us at Paella or the MA Phil program. We now have a full distance program. Come study with me and even more importantly, come study with uh, William Lane Craig. If I could ask you two more questions, one is just fun, which is what's your favorite movie? <sighs> Boy, that's really hard because there's so many right at the top of the Wait, list. You know? I, I officially stumped William Lane Craig just for the record. <laughs> Let it be stated that I got him, although that wasn't well, my question. Well, it's from a, a, a wealth uh, <laughs> or an uh, abundance of riches. Uh, I, I think Ingrid Bergman was fantastic. And so I love movies like Notorious and Casablanca and Gaslight. Wow. Boy, in, in the movie Gaslight, there's a scene where she looks at her husband, who's been deceiving her, trying to drive her crazy. And if looks could kill, oh, man, the look that she gives at him would be a manslayer. It, it's really remarkable. So I like these old Ingrid Bergman movies. I, the Maltese Falcon is another great movie with Humphrey Bogart and uh, Peter Lorre and Sidney wow. Greenstreet. Uh, I, I love that movie. Uh, and then, you know, The Bridge Over the River Kwai is a very moving film that is an epical film that 
I, I really enjoyed too. So those would just be a few that come to mind. Those are great examples. F- final question that people ask me almost almost daily. I'll get a tweet or an email or somebody like today, a young man asked me from Canada. He's in grade 11. He said, I want to be an apologist, maybe even want to go to Biola. What advice mm-hmm. do you have for me, what I can do now as a younger kind of aspiring apologist? So what advice would you give yeah. to younger apologists to be effective? Well, now, if he's, if he's really that young, I, I think he needs to the, embark on a college prep program in his high school uh, and maybe even his junior and senior year take AP classes that would prepare him for college. Uh, I kind of sloughed off in high school in some respects, uh, and I, I wish I hadn't. I, I would encourage students at that age to to really bite off as much as they can chew and take that good college prep curriculum while they're in high school. I would supplement it, I think, with some study of logic as early as they can. Okay. Uh, I have a little textbook for children called Introduction to Logic that is very suitable for eight to 11 year old uh, kids uh, and people of all ages. Uh, and I would recommend that. Um, I suppose though, most of all, Sean, I would not emphasize the academic preparation as much as I would his spiritual preparation. He needs to be sure he's read the Bible from cover to cover. He understands Old and New Testament contents. He has some understanding of Christian doctrine. I would say work through a book like Bruce Milne's book, Know the Truth, which is a very good survey of Christian doctrine. I think he needs to be really grounded uh, uh, theologically um, even before he begins to plunge into philosophical studies. That's great advice. I actually remember you gave me that advice uh, similar when Mm -hmm. I was at Talbot. I was getting the MA Phil, and you said, well, you're getting a theology degree too. You and my dad both encouraged me to get an MA uh, theology, and it has served me very well. Oh, well, good. There, There's a whole bunch of more questions people have, but I definitely want to respect your time. This has been so interesting. Thanks not only for your ministry and friendship, but just coming on and sharing some stories and giving us some insights about about your life. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us. Wonderful, wonderful questions. And thanks again, Dr. Craig, for coming on.